When you're looking to get solar for your home, one of the trickiest yet most important decisions you'll face is choosing the right size of inverter. So many people get this wrong and end up regretting it. In this video then, I'm going to walk you through all the considerations so that you can size your inverter correctly to get the absolute best from your system. And not just for today, but also the future. Hi there, I'm Gary and welcome back to my channel, Gary Does Solar. Before we get into the detail, it's probably worth understanding the role of the inverter within your solar setup. There are actually a few different types of inverter available, string inverters, hybrid inverters, and even micro inverters. We'll be looking at all of these in turn, starting with the string inverter. Here you can see a string inverter sitting between an array of solar panels on the left and your home electricity circuit on the right. An inverter is an essential component of any home solar setup because the electricity that your solar panels produce is DC or direct current, but all of your home appliances run on AC electricity, alternating current. And because AC and DC are incompatible with each other, an inverter is required to convert that DC into AC. Now, if you're not familiar with alternating current and direct current, don't worry, I can get you up to speed in no time if you watch this video I made. The link is in the description. Now your home appliances will normally draw power from the grid, which you pay for by the kilowatt hour. For example, if the home requirement at the moment is three kilowatts, the grid will supply all of that power. But here we also have a solar installation. And if it's a sunny day, the generation from your solar array will take precedence over drawing from the grid, saving you money. Let's say we have a five kilowatt peak array, which is generating two kilowatts DC power. The string inverter converts this into AC and feeds it to the home. Now that's not quite enough to supply all of the home requirement, but it does reduce the amount the grid has to supply to just one kilowatt, saving you money. And should the solar generation increase to three kilowatts, that is enough to meet the home requirement. And so the grid won't need to supply any electricity at all, saving you more money. And to complete the picture, if your solar array is generating more power than the home needs right now, let's say five kilowatts of power, it's all converted from DC to AC by the inverter and fed into the home. The home appliances consume three kilowatts of that, but the remainder is exported back to the grid, invariably being used by your neighbors. Now, depending on the country you live in, you may get paid for that exported energy if you're on a suitable smart tariff. String inverters come in all different sizes, specifically different AC power ratings, the maximum amount of power that can be converted from DC into AC. So how do you go about determining which size then is best for your situation? Well, let's start by considering the maximum power output of your solar array. It feels logical that your inverter size should be the same size as your solar array, so that when the array is performing at its peak, all of that DC electricity can be converted into AC and fed into the home. But it doesn't have to be. A smaller inverter will be cheaper and perhaps operate more efficiently. Let's take a look at the typical daily solar generation curve of our array. We'll assume that the array is above the equator and south facing. As you can see, it's only in the middle of the day that we achieve maximum generation. So instead of sizing our string inverter to that same power level, let's make it smaller, say four kilowatts instead of five. This is called array oversizing, or if you like, inverter undersizing. And most inverters are able to operate with arrays which are 50 to 100% above their AC rating. What that means is on very sunny days, when the generation goes above the AC limit of the inverter, it will be attenuated or clipped to the AC limit like so. So even if the panels are generating five kilowatts DC, only four kilowatts of that is converted to AC for use in the home. Here, the clipping is minor and only a small fraction of the generation is lost. And that's only when conditions are perfect, sunny summer days. A cloudy day in summer or a sunny day in winter will result in lower generation, so there would be no clipping to worry about anyway. So having a slightly smaller inverter than your array has minimal impact. But what if we made it smaller still, let's say down to three kilowatts? Let's go back to that sunny day in summer and reduce the inverter size. Here you can see the clipping is more pronounced. And even on a sunny day in winter, there is still some clipping. So your overall annual solar generation would be reduced. It's worth pointing out though that a smaller inverter will spend more of its time operating near its AC limit. 
And that's a good thing because inverters are more efficient when they're operating at the top end of their range. Clipping is quite an involved topic and for more information on it, take a look at my video here which gets into the detail. There's also an online utility I developed shown in that video that allows you to model all sorts of scenarios, different array sizes against different sized inverters to see what the actual impact is from a monetary point of view. Let's now consider another factor, the typical maximum power requirement of your home. If you choose an inverter size too small, it may not be able to supply sufficient power to all your home appliances, especially if some of those are heavy appliances like dishwashers or clothes dryers. And if the inverter cannot supply the power required, the grid will step in to provide it, again costing you money. This is even more of an issue when we look at solar and battery, which we'll cover later. But first, if you're getting a lot from this video, please like and subscribe as it really helps the channel reach more people. Thank you. There are a couple of other reasons why you might want to consider a larger inverter size. Firstly, depending on the country you live in, your DNO or distribution network operator, sometimes called distribution system operator, may place a limit on the amount of power you can export back to the grid in order to protect the grid infrastructure. And requesting a larger inverter size may pave the way for a higher export limit as the inverter size is used in the DNO's calculations. The higher your export limit, of course, the more you'll be able to help out the grid environmentally. And in some countries, including the UK, you can earn a fair amount of money from exporting lots of energy back to the grid. At the moment, there are export rates available in the UK that are around 50% of the import rate. I think you know that my favorite energy provider in the UK is Octopus Energy. They offer such rates, but if you've got a compatible inverter and battery, they have a special tariff called Intelligent Octopus Flux, where amazingly import and export is at the same rate. If you'd like to switch your energy provider to Octopus Energy, feel free to use my referral code here and we'll both get £50. This helps support the work on my channel. Thank you. Another reason why you might want to consider a larger inverter size is if your array is very large or it spans several roof segments. This is because a string inverter typically only has two of what are known as MPPTs or maximum power point trackers. Each MPPT can manage a certain number of panels and very large arrays might need three or four of these. Additionally, if you have solar panels on multiple roof orientations or pitches, these ideally should be on separate MPPTs. And what you'll find is that the larger inverters typically have more MPPTs. For example, looking at the SIG Energy SIG Store battery here, there are quite a number of inverter sizes available, both for single phase and three phase supplies. The green dots that you see indicate the number of MPPTs available for each of those inverter sizes. And if we look at the Tesla Powerwall 3, it comes with three MPPTs as standard. But for some countries, including the USA, it has an amazing six MPPTs built in, providing a great deal of flexibility. OK, let's move on to a different type of inverter now called a hybrid inverter. It has all the same core functionality as a string inverter, but it also allows you to connect a home battery to it, specifically on the DC side. Here's how that works in practice then. If the home needs power and there isn't enough solar generation to cover it, the hybrid inverter automatically discharges the battery to supply the extra power to the house, avoiding the need to draw from the grid, saving you money. If there is more solar generation than the home needs, the hybrid inverter automatically charges the battery with that excess. And once the battery is fully charged, any remaining excess solar generation is exported to the grid, just as with the string inverter. Most hybrid inverters can also be programmed to force charge the battery from the grid at specific times. This feature is particularly valuable during the winter months when solar generation is low. You can charge the battery overnight using cheaper off-peak electricity rates and then use that stored energy during the day to power your home, saving you money compared to importing electricity at standard daytime rates. There's another interesting benefit with the battery being connected to the inverter on the DC side, which by the way is described as a DC coupled battery. If you've chosen a hybrid inverter that's smaller than your solar array size, where you might normally get clipping because of the inverter's AC output limit, then provided the battery's not already fully charged, all the solar power that would normally have been clipped can go straight into the battery instead. This works because both the solar input and the battery operate in DC, 
So the inverter's AC limit doesn't apply to power heading to the battery. How cool is that? Now when we were talking about the string inverter earlier, I mentioned that if lots of home appliances were running, even if there was plenty of solar coming in to cover that demand, the AC output limit of a smaller inverter could mean that you'd still pull some power from the grid. Now that might not be a big issue in practice, of course, because the chances of running so many high-powered appliances right in the middle of the day when solar is peaking is usually pretty low. But with a hybrid inverter and battery, the limitation becomes more of a problem. In the early evening, for example, your home's power demand might spike quite high, and even though that demand could be met with the stored battery power, the AC limit of a smaller inverter will still cap the total power going into your home. And if the home demand exceeds that limit, you'll end up drawing from the grid again, wasting the opportunity to use your battery. So it's worth calculating your home's typical power draw at different times of the day, especially during those early evening peaks, and then make a determination on a suitable inverter size against that. Also check the battery system's maximum discharge rate. There's no point going for a larger inverter if the battery can't discharge fast enough to get even close to that limit anyway. There's one other type of inverter that I'd like to cover in this video, and that's a micro-inverter. If a string inverter converts the DC power coming in from a whole array of panels to AC, a microinverter does the same job, but this time for only one solar panel. Microinverters are very small units and they're attached directly behind the solar panel on your roof. So if you have 16 panels, you'll need 16 microinverters. An AC cable then runs down from your roof and into the home AC supply. Microinverters offer some advantages over traditional string inverter systems, including ease of installation, especially for complex roof layouts. They also offer performance monitoring of each panel, and they're very good at shading management. And if you want to know more about this, take a look at this video, which goes into some detail on these benefits and more. Again, the link is in the description. Enphase is the world's largest manufacturer of microinverters, having shipped nearly 85 million of them across 160 countries to date. And they offer a whole range of microinverter products, each with a different power rating, essentially the same as the AC limit of a string inverter. So when we talk about inverter sizing, we can apply the same principles that we talked about earlier, but this time on a much smaller scale. You can see that Enphase's most capable residential-based product today is the IQ8HC, and it has a maximum continuous power rating of 380 watts. And because solar panel sizes have a much larger power rating today, going for a microinverter solution means that you're likely to be subject to clipping on very sunny days in the summer months. Here I've plotted a solar generation curve for one 480 watt solar panel with an IQ8HC microinverter. You can see the clipping. And unlike with a hybrid inverter, there's no way to counteract that clipping using a DC coupled battery. This is because with a microinverter, the DC is already converted to AC on the roof. You can still have a battery system with a microinverter based approach, but only by using an AC coupled battery. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. It makes sense then to go for the highest power rating you can with a microinverter to minimize any clipping as far as possible. But there is one very important consideration, and that's your DNO. Your DNO will want to understand the maximum power that your system could theoretically send back to the grid. For a string inverter based system, assuming the home demand was zero, this is simply the AC limit of the inverter. Even if you had an oversized solar array, all of that sits behind the string inverter. So the AC limit still governs the amount of power coming through. And if we look at a hybrid inverter based system, it's exactly the same. Even though you might have a large solar array, let's say 10 kilowatts, and a battery system that can also output at 10 kilowatts. If the AC limit of the inverter is say 8 kilowatts, that's the maximum amount of power that could ever be output to the grid because everything sits behind that AC limit. For a microinverter based solution though, it's very different. To work out the maximum power that your system could theoretically send back to the grid, the DNO will add up the power ratings of all the microinverters. Let's say 20 microinverters, each at 380 watts, would work out to 7.6 kilowatts. The DNO will then add to that the maximum power output of any AC coupled battery system you have. Let's say a Tesla Powerwall 3 rated at 11.5 kilowatts output. That totals 19.1 kilowatts. And I don't know about you, 
But if it's on a single phase supply, some DNOs may have an issue with that. They may place a restriction on the maximum output of the microinverters, which Enphase has a mechanism for, or they may place a restriction on the battery power output, or they may do both. Don't worry though, if you are looking at a microinverter based solution, a good installer will be able to sit down with you and work all this through. And talking about good installers, if you live in the UK and you're not sure which installer to go with, whether that be for a string, hybrid or microinverter solution, I provide a directory service that only lists who I think are the best installers out there, ones that I would trust with my own money if I were getting a new installation today. Just type getreadyfor.solar into your browser, or take a photo of the QR code you see here to find a great installer serving your area. So as you can see, there's a heck of a lot to think about when deciding on which approach to take for your solar setup. And I think this video here will be helpful to you in that, especially in regard to the differences between AC and DC coupled batteries. I thoroughly recommend you watch it. And as before, the link is in the description. Okay, going back to string and hybrid inverters again, one final reason why you might want to consider a larger unit, and it's certainly influencing my own decision with the new SIG Energy battery system I'm getting installed. By the way, you can find out more about my adventure on that here in this video, which details all of the reasons why I'm changing from my existing battery to the SIG Energy SIG Store. I already have an AC EV charger, which is the MyEnergy Zappi, but being on a single phase supply here in the UK, the charging rate is limited to a paltry seven kilowatts. That means it would take roughly 10 hours to charge my EV overnight. And the trouble is the EV smart tariffs on offer today here in the UK typically only provide five or six hours of cheap rate charging. One way to increase the charge rate is to install a DC EV charger and SIG Energy offers such a solution. There are two variants, a 25 kilowatt charger and a 12 kilowatt charger. As I'm on a single phase, there is a limit to how much power I can draw from the grid. But if I went for the 12 kilowatt charger, I could charge my EV in almost half the time and therefore stay within the five or six hours of cheap rate electricity. In order to achieve the 12 kilowatt charging rate though, I believe I would have to make sure that my inverter size was at least 12 kilowatts as well. I'll be honest with you, this is an area I'm still learning about, so I welcome everyone's input. Do you have a SIG Energy SIG in store with the DC EV charger module? What's your experience so far and have you seen any limitations? Please let me know in the comments, thank you. Although in this video, there seem to be many reasons today to go for a larger inverter, do remember that a smaller inverter will be cheaper to buy and it will often operate more efficiently by running closer to its rated AC output during typical production hours and it will consume less power when it's idle. Quite a lot of considerations I know, but hopefully this video will be helpful to you in your decision making. I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters who make all these videos possible. And if you'd like to support me in this way, it's very easy to do. Just sign up via the link that you see here. Cheers for now.